Grace and peace to you and welcome on this 12th Sunday after the Pentecost. We continue our summer series of hearing the parables that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Matthew. But today we finally, after many weeks, have left the boat and the beach and we hear the famous parable that Jesus tells about a vineyard owner who hires some workers and uh, pays them in unusual ways. Our worship begins with the prelude. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us gather with true hearts that confess our sins to God, that earnestly ask for forgiveness, and that trust in our renewal through the work of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess, I confess to you all, all my sins with which, which I have offended you and my neighbors. I am, I am sorry for them. them. I devote Put myself to repentance and pray for your mercy. In your boundless grace and compassion, send me your Holy Spirit that I may be strengthened in my faith and made ready for a life obedient to your will and your way. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Therefore, in obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn uh, has a slight typo. The refrain is missing. So if you want to use the hymnal that's in front of you, it is hymn number 688 uh, in that hymnal.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. So with you. Let us pray. Our God and Lord, Lord, your wisdom wisdom is beyond our understanding, understanding, your love beyond our apprehension. apprehension. Through the transforming power of the Spirit, you continue to reveal your mercy to those to whom we are merciless, and you welcome into your kingdom those whom we shun. Do not let us become discouraged with your love. Rather, Rather, by by the same same Spirit, spirit, draw draw us more more fully into into your mission, mission, that that we will experience the amazing fellowship fellowship destined through your Son, Jesus Jesus Christ. Amen. down God's command to go to the great city of Nineveh to preach about its destruction and after having been thrown overboard from a ship and swallowed by a large fish and after having repented in the belly of the fish and being thrown up on the shore 
the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to walk from one end of it to the other. When Jonah arrived, he walked in the city for a whole day before he cried out, In forty days Nineveh will be overthrown! The people of Nineveh believed God. They declared a solemn fast, and everyone from infants to the aged put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then the king had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock will eat anything. They will not feed and they will not drink water. People and animals will both be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Everyone will turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Then, who knows, may God, God may actually repent and change God's mind. God may turn away from God's fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw how the people of Nineveh turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God had said God would bring upon them. And God did not do it. But Jonah was not happy with God's repentance. Jonah became angry. He said to the Lord, O oh Lord, didn't I say this was going to happen when I was still at home? This is why I ran to Tarshish instead of coming here to Nineveh. I knew then that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. So now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah left the city and sat down east of the city, where he set up a small tent and sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. But the Lord God made a bush to grow over Jonah's head to shade him and save him from his discomfort. Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when the dawn came up the next day, God called over a worm that attacked the bush so that it immediately withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. Jonah said, It is better for me to die than live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you, which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left? and also many animals. The word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God. This morning's psalm is 145, which we will read responsively. 
I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every, Every day, day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His, gentle, his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall love your works to another, and shall, shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of the awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The second lesson is from Second Philippians. Paul writes, I wish to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ and that most of the brothers and sisters have been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. Dare now to speak the word even with even bolder greatness and without fear. There are some who are proclaiming Christ out of envy and rivalry. These, pro <clears throat> These proclaim light... Oh. But there are many others who proclaim Christ out of goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of loving friendship, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish amb ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. But what does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in all, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this is my moment of stepping out into salvation." It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but have all boldness in everything, that now Christ will be exalted in my body, whether through life or through death. For to me, living Christ and, di and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I will prefer. But I am being hard-pressed between the two. My passion is clinging to departing and being with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake, and this may per persuade you to understand that I will remain. I will remain all along with all of you for your progress and joy in faith in order to in order that your boasting in Christ Jesus may be abounding in me through my coming again to you only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether coming and seeing you or whether going and hearing about you, you are standing firm in one spirit, one soul, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not fearing any who are opposing it. For them this is evidence of their destruction, but for you it is evidence of your salvation, and this is from God. For you have been freely given on this behalf, of Christ on not only the faith in Christ but also the suffering on behalf of Christ since you 
are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus told this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who went out in the morning to hire laborers to work in his vineyard. He negotiated the usual daily wage with them and then sent them into his vineyard. Then, about nine o'clock that morning, he saw other laborers idly standing around in the marketplace. So he said to them, Go, work in my vineyard, and I will give you whatever is righteous. And they went out to work. Later in the day, at both noon and three o'clock, the head of the household went back to the market and did the same with the other laborers he found there with nothing to do. Then, even later in the day, at about five o'clock in the evening, the vineyard owner went back to the marketplace and found more laborers just standing around. So he said to them, Why are you standing here idly all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, go, work in my vineyard. An hour later, at six in the evening, when the workday was finally over, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call all the laborers out of the vineyard and pay them in this order. The ones who came to work last get paid first, and the ones who came to work first get paid last. When the laborers who were hired at five o'clock in the evening came up to be paid, they were each given the usual daily wage. When those who were hired at six o'clock in the morning saw this, they assumed that they would get much more. But when they came up to be paid, they also received the usual daily wage. So those who had worked all day grumbled about the owner of the vineyard saying, These laborers you hired last only worked one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who are bearing the burden of the day and the scorching heat. To which the owner of the vineyard replied, Friends, I'm not being unrighteous with you, am I? Didn't you agree to work for me for the usual daily wage? So now (coughs) take what is yours and go. I desire to give to the one who was the last the same I give to you who were first. Is it not lawful for me to carry out my desire with what is mine? Or are you giving me the evil eye because I am good? In this way, the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, O Christ. So when I hear this parable, I can't help but think about being at 7-Eleven at 6 o'clock in the morning and seeing a group of people standing off to the side of the parking lot waiting to get hired for labor for the day. Now, I've never been one of those people, and I've actually never hired one of those people, which I'm assuming is the same for you. I doubt any of us have ever been one of those people or hired anybody. So really we don't have much experience with the labor system that Jesus is talking about in this parable that he tells. Still, we do, we have seen it and we have some thought about what it must be like. And so when I hear this parable, I think about those people and I wonder how they would respond to the parable that Jesus is telling. I wonder, What would they think about how the workers are paid at the end of the day? What would they think about this vineyard owner? What do you think? What do you think about how the workers are paid? What do you think about the vineyard owner? I think this is just a terrific parable because I find that in this parable, Jesus is challenging us to radically reorient our evaluative point of view on at least three things. And to get at that, we need to go back to the parking lot at the 7-Eleven at 6 o'clock in the morning. And let's say you are a contractor, 
and you've got to get some drywall work done and some painting done on this office renovation project you're working on. So you roll into the parking lot at 6 o'clock in the morning and you see six people standing off to the side waiting to be hired. And let's say they've got paintbrushes and drywall tools in their hands, so you know they can all do the work that you need done. What do you do? Well, you probably decide, how many workers do I need today? Let's say you need all six of them. So what do you do? You hire all six of them, pile them into the van, right? That makes sense. Except that's not what the vineyard owner does in the story, is it? In the story, the vineyard owner doesn't hire all of the workers at the beginning of the day. Instead, he goes back and forth, hiring people all day long. Now, does this mean that the vineyard owner is just not a good project manager? This vineyard owner just has miscalculated the labor requirements necessary to complete the project for the day and has to keep going back to get more. Do we just assume that this vineyard owner is not too bright? Or can we assume that this vineyard owner is actually a good project manager? who has correctly assessed the labor necessary for the day, but then has deliberately decided not to hire all the workers needed at the beginning of the day. Sounds strange, but why would the vineyard owner do that? Well, let's go back to the 7-Eleven parking lot, where you have now piled all six workers into your van, and you're driving out. What about the next contractor who comes in to hire some labor? There's no one to hire. What happens to that contractor's project that day? It doesn't get done. But really, what do you care about that, right? I mean, who cares about his project? He's the competition anyway. We don't worry about others in that way, especially we don't worry about the people coming after us. We got to take care of ourselves now, here. That's how things are done. That's what makes sense, right? You don't worry about those people. I hear Jesus challenging us to radically reorient our evaluative point of view when this vineyard owner understands that good project management in the kingdom means taking care of all of the vineyards, doing what is good for all of the vineyards. And this can be challenging news for us because, you know, that's not the way things work, is it? This vineyard owner is being pretty radical in, to use kindergarten terminology, in the way that he's sharing, in this case, sharing labor. To put it in more churchy terminology for you, this vineyard owner is having care and concern for others and even those coming after him in a radical way. Now, the second really interesting moment in the parable does come when that owner of the vineyard goes back to hire more people. Eventually, at the end of the day, he says to the folks who are standing around, hey, why aren't you guys working? And they say, no one's hired us. Well, duh, of course not, because you guys are the losers. You're the rejects. You're the third string people. You're the applicant whose resume is really thin, who's just got no experience that we want whatsoever. I mean, clearly there is a good reason why these people are not chosen, right? Or is there? When you were a kid and you were on the playground and the team captain was choosing the people who are going to be on his kickball team or baseball team, and you are one of the last people chosen, was it really because you were just that much worse at kickball or baseball than the other kids who were chosen before you? Is that how it works? I hear Jesus challenging us to radically reorient our evaluative point of view on who is chosen and why they are chosen. As this vineyard owner chooses the very people that others did not. 
which can be good news, especially, especially for those of us who may feel like we're not chosen that often, who may feel like we are at last and least, who feel like it's great to hear that somebody wants us and needs us, that there is work for us to do in the kingdom. That's good news. This vineyard owner chooses me. But, you know, on the other hand, it can be challenging news for those of us who are confident about our having been chosen, who understand the fairness of our privilege in the kingdom. Well, we're not concerned about whether we're in or not. It's more a concern about the company we're going to have to keep in this kingdom. I mean, really? Is it really fair that I have to work alongside them? The vineyard owner is choosing in a radical way. Now, the climax of the story comes in the evening at 6 o'clock when all the workers are called together and they are getting paid, right? So what do you think? <laughs> is it fair what happens? Ooh, somebody said something. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the rest of you, I know you're Lutherans, but you can nod or go like this. Do you think it was fair? No. Yeah, no. yeah of course not. It's not fair. Clearly not fair. Even the people who are paying paid a full day's wage when they only worked one hour, they don't think it's fair. They're just happy to get paid that much, right? They're not going to complain at all. Would you complain? I wouldn't complain. I'd feel like, wow, this is my lucky day. <laughs> is it fair? No, but, you know, who cares? Works for me. And, of course, the people who worked all day long and get the same pay, definitely they don't think it's fair. And they complain about it. Wouldn't you? Of course. But the interesting thing to me is that for both groups, for both groups, their understanding of what is fair and right and just in the present is determined by the past. Those workers who feel like they're lucky because they're getting paid for a full day even though they worked for an hour feel that it's lucky because of what they did, one hour's work. The people who are grumbling because they think it's not fair or right or just that they get paid the same because they worked all day, feel that way because they worked all day. Both groups turn to the past to determine what is fair and right and just in the present. And that's how it works, isn't it, folks? That's what we do. But not the vineyard owner. That's because the vineyard owner's a Lutheran. <laughs> Did you see the footnote that's there in the bulletin when they... Vineyard. You look in your Bible, it says vineyard owner was a Lutheran. And this good Lutheran vineyard owner doesn't look to the past, to one's past work or actions or inactions or whatever, to determine what is fair and right and just for you in the kingdom at this present moment. Instead, this good Lutheran vineyard worker simply relies on the word of promise that has been given. A promise given to each worker that they will receive what is righteous. I hear Jesus challenging us to radically reorient our understanding of the importance of the past for what is fair and right and just in the present when this vineyard owner simply relies on the promise of the word. Which you know, can be good news but really isn't. I think even we Lutherans are challenged by this idea. Because it is normal for us to look to our past, to try and catalog the good things we have done or try and confess the not-so-good things we have done and decide then, based on our past histories, what is it that we deserve in this present moment? What would be fair and right and just for us and for them based on what has happened? It is a challenge for us to let go and be liberated from our past and embrace more fully the reality of the promise that we've been given. The promise that opens the future 
that provides us hope. This vineyard owner, in his embracing of the promise and in his steadfastness in carrying out the word of that promise for each worker, is doing something radical. Now, I really do think that the vineyard owner is a Lutheran, but I also think that this whole parable is a Lutheran story. And spoiler alert, I think all the parables are Lutheran stories. Just, <laughs> sorry. But the reason I think that this story, this parable, is especially a Lutheran parable is because even though we get all wrapped up in what's happening that day, what's going on with the workers and the vineyard owner and who's getting paid what, even though we're all consumed by that, I think Jesus is telling us, we Lutherans, this parable because he wants us to contemplate what happens tomorrow. What happens tomorrow when that vineyard owner goes back to the 7-Eleven parking lot at 6 o'clock trying to hire people? Is anybody going to get in the van at 6 in the morning? I hear Jesus challenging us to radically reorient our evaluative point of view on who it is that we need to have care and concern for now and coming behind us. I hear Jesus challenging us, we Lutherans, to radically reorient our evaluative point of view of who it is that is chosen and why. To liberate ourselves from our past and to liberate others from their past and see each other through the promise that God has given to each of us. Because we are the people of tomorrow in this parable today. So, are you ready to get on the van? Are you going to do the work of the kingdom? Or are you going to step back and wait a bit? See how things go. What do you think? We confess our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, God, in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven, heaven and, and earth. earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters in grace, today we listen and learn from your word. Uh, many of us were baptized as children into the waters of the Holy Spirit. Others find their way to the Lord as adults, and some as late as their final days. As we learn in today's readings, our service to the Lord is welcome, regardless of when it begins. We will answer the petition of this morning's prayer, Lord, in your wisdom, with hear our prayer. Lord, in your service, as Jonah was hesitant to follow your commands or make sense of your motives, we are often distracted with the chaos we've created. Spoiling the beautiful home you've provided here on earth, we've hoarded our food. Frequently wasteful and slow or miserly with sharing our gifts, we polluted the garden of nature with greed and wars, and we have ignored climate change. Guide us now to abandon these destructive habits and put our labor to serving you and others. Let us stop our idleness and put our time into prayer, praise, and service in your name. Lord, in your wisdom, hear our prayer. Lord of all blessings, Bless the tireless rescue crews searching for lost family members on Maui. Let those seeking to serve the survivors with food, shelter, or rebuilding homes find fruits in their labor and generosity from those who help to support them. Lord, in your wisdom, hear our prayer. Protective Lord, as the shepherd protects his sheep in the field, we rely on our prayers to you for protection from danger, great and small. Today, the West Coast is facing floods and wind damage as a result of a tropical storm. We pray for your protection for those in the path of the storm. We pray that their faith sustains them and gives them the courage needed for whatever may come. Lord, in your wisdom, hear our prayer. With our trust in you, Lord, we pray for our entire Grace family, including those in our ongoing prayer list and those of whom we speak aloud or quietly whisper in our hearts. We gratefully receive your mercy and grace, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The peace of our Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace. 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 peace.
Let us pray. Living, Living God, God, we praise you for the abundant blessings of this life. In humble recognition of the love you always show to us, we bring these gifts and ourselves as our thanks. Use them and us to bear the fruit of goodness and grace, so that your glory will be known to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. We, you, we praise you and we worship and adore you. For you formed the earth from chaos. You encircled the globe with air. You created fire for warmth and light, and you nourished the lands with water. You molded us in your image, and with mercy higher than the mountains and grace deeper than the seas, you blessed the Israelites, choosing and cherishing them as your own that we also, who are estranged and dying, might be adopted to live in your spirit, you called to us through the life and death of your Son, Jesus. It was he who, on the night he was handed over, took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for my remembrance. Then after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for my remembrance. Our Father, Father who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this, this day our daily, daily bread. bread. And, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let's go in peace. Amen. Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God of abundance, with this bread of life and this cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Just want to give you a quick update. We had a blood drive here on the third, and we collected 32 pints of blood, which is really great. So thank you for all who came and bled for the cause. Uh, it was very needed. And next Sunday, we're going to have Holy Cow Sunday. It's kind of an annual thing. Uh, you'll want to stay because we've got ice cream from the blue pig. I know, pig, cow, but you know, there's no blue cow. Uh, well, there is. It's a coffee shop. But uh, so we've got all kinds of crazy flavors. You know, come and try something like elderberry or orange cardamom. We also have the basic ones like chocolate, chocolate chip, Oreo cookie, those kinds. But uh, we're trying to raise money to buy two cows for Heifer Project International, which provides cows to communities that need milk and cheese and other things and ways of sustaining the community and providing income to the community. So let's see if we can get two cows next Holy Cow Sunday, and if you can you know, challenge yourself to try a new flavor of ice cream. Brothers and sisters, go now and serve the Lord in peace. Thanks be to God. <laughs>